Self-Reliance by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is an essay that really, I think many of us end up reading in school. It's considered one of the more famous and influential essays ever written. Uh, it was written by Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1841, and it, it captures his beliefs and his arguments on individualism and not necessarily a living in the woods being completely self-sufficient, that type of self-reliant, like a Thoreau, but more of a relying on your own ideas, believing in yourself, trusting your instincts and your own ideas above those that are given to you by society or other people. I wanted to do this essay for a few reasons. One, I remember reading it a long time ago and really enjoying it, so it was a good excuse to reread it. Uh, two, I think it's an interesting next step after talking about the Communist Manifesto last week. Obviously, maybe the wealth of nations or something would be a more polar switch from that. But this is, you know, again, going in kind of a different thematic direction. And I'm also interested in very short books that have had a big impact because I think one problem today is that so many books get puffed up and expanded to two, three hundred words that just don't need to be. And so self-reliance is only about 20 pages long in this print. So that's maybe 6,000 words, maybe 8,000 words. And it's full of really wonderful ideas that I'm excited to share with you today. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just want to take a moment to tell you about Readwise. If you haven't used Readwise, it is the absolute best app for anybody who loves reading. I use it to read all of the articles online. I think it has the best in class article reader. Uh, I also use it to save my highlights and notes from everything that I read. So if you're reading something on Kindle or iBooks, it will just automatically pull out any highlights that you take and save them for you and send them to any note-taking tool that you use. And if you read physical books like I do, uh, I'll just mark with little sticky tabs as I go. And then I can use my phone to take pictures of the page and automatically scan in the highlights. It is so, so helpful for getting the most out of every single book I read, making sure that I can find uh, any quotations or ideas are really loved in the future. If you're a serious reader, you absolutely need this tool. You can go to readwise.io slash NAT to get a two-month free trial. It's a month longer than they normally do, and it's a great way to help support the show. So again, just go to readwise.io slash NAT and check it out if you haven't already. And let's get back to the episode. So I think we should just dive right on into it, starting off with one of the really most important and core ideas of the essay, uh, the importance of relying on your own beliefs. Right off the bat, in the fourth sentence of the essay, he says, to believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. And this is a, a very powerful thought because I think a lot of us somewhat naively believe that the thoughts that we hold deep down, maybe don't express and don't share, are very unique to us. But at root, most people are struggling with or afraid of the same things. That's been one of the very common themes in this podcast with many of the books that I've covered, is that there really are these universal fears, desires, struggles uh, that a lot of us are, are working through in our own way. And so to recognize that some of these very deep down, very personal, maybe scary feelings or thoughts are actually universal and shared with all of mankind, that is, as Emerson's saying here, genius. There's a line that I've heard before that I really like that uh, what's most personal is most universal. And that's one way that you can think about some of these ideas. Things that feel extremely unique to you might actually be some of the most relatable thoughts that uh, you have and that you could share with other people. And so he goes on and says that a man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. So you need to learn to detect when uh, when an idea crosses your mind or a thought crosses your mind that is yours, that hasn't been planted there by society or something that you read. Yet he dismisses without notice his thought because it is his. Just because it's your thought doesn't mean that you should throw it away. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. This is such a great line, right? In, in every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. You certainly heard somebody say something to the effect of, oh, I had the idea for Facebook ages ago. And well, okay, but <laughs> you didn't act on it, right? And this is why uh, some books might be frustrating to read or some influencers might be frustrating to see because they're doing things that you have also thought or said or believed and you, you might feel angry or jealous or feel some envy. And that's because 
some part of you recognizes that you also had that thought, but you did nothing with it. And so Emerson's really encouraging you that when you have these thoughts is you should trust that they are valuable, trust that they might have utility to other people and you should act on them. You shouldn't reject them just because they're yours. Just because they're yours doesn't mean that they aren't uh, good and valuable to others. And, and in some ways, seeing some of your own ideas reflected in these works of other people is kind of a sign that you might actually have uh, good ideas of your own. And the, the consequence of not acting on those ideas can be really brutal, as he lays out here. He says, Else tomorrow a stranger will say with masterly good sense precisely what we have thought and felt all the time, and we shall be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another. It's a great way of capturing the idea. You'll be forced to take with shame your own opinion from another. It, maybe you've even had this thought, or this is kind of like the classic hipster thing, right? I, I knew of them before they were cool, right? I found that person on YouTube when they were just coming up, and now everybody knows about them, and it's not cool anymore. This is kind of that same thing, right? <laughs> you might have an opinion, but then it gets uh, better expressed by someone else or more forcefully expressed by somebody else, and suddenly they are known for that opinion or their idea, and you almost feel embarrassed to keep professing it because it will seem as if you have gotten the idea from that person instead of uh, having it of your own accord. So again, right, it, more pressure to share your ideas with the world, to get them out there. He says, there is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse as his portion. That though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given to him to till. We're taking this to kind of the next step, right? He's saying that envy is pointless, right? You, you, there is no reason being jealous of somebody else because uh, one, yes, maybe they expressed an idea that you also had and you failed to act on, but that's your fault for not doing it. So there's no reason to be envious. And two, this next thing that he's getting at is that we each have our own special zone of genius, our, our own area where we can really uh, thrive and do our best work. And you need to recognize uh, what is in your lane and out of it. And basically anything that anybody else makes is kind of out of your lane. There's no reason to be jealous of someone and no reason to try to copy someone because you can't really win at somebody else's game. Like they're doing your thing and you have to do your own thing as well. And just as you wouldn't want them to do what you're doing and they probably couldn't do what you're doing or what you're good at as well as you, you shouldn't try to uh, succeed at what, what somebody else is doing. Right? I love this line that no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given to him to till. We each have that own plot of land in our in our mind, in our brain, uh, that we get to grow on, that we get to cultivate. And yearning for something grown in somebody else's soil just doesn't make sense. And so he goes on to say, I make this really important distinction. A man is relieved and gay when he has put his heart into his work and done his best. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. And there's a very important, subtle distinction there. When he has put his heart into his work and done his best, you won't feel relieved and gay if you are simply doing your best. Because again, doing really well, it's something that's somebody else's game, performing at somebody else's task or doing work that's assigned to you, but that doesn't have any meaning behind it. Or right? stuff that wouldn't be approved of in the uh, turning pro or 4,000 weeks like set of ideas that I talked about in previous episodes. You need both. It, it needs to both be done as best it possibly can. And it has to be something that you can have your heart in. It has to be part of that like soil in your mind that only you can till. That is when you will feel the, the gayest and most relieved with your work. But Emerson says it's very hard to do that because society doesn't want you to be individual. It wants you to conform. It wants you to blend in with everyone else. Society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Society is a joint stock company in which the members agree for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue in most requests is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. So if you want to be independent, if you want to be self-reliant, if you want to stand on your own two feet, have your own ideas, cultivate uh, that, that soil in your brain, you kind of have to be comfortable going against society. And he says in the next sentence, whoso would be a man must be a non-conformist. If you want to Again, recognize that that zone of genius in you, you must be willing to go against society 
uh, to some extent because it wants to get everyone to to conform, to go along with what's normal. And one of the hardest parts of doing that is focusing on what you know you need to do and what you must do, not what everybody else wants you to do. He says, what I must do is all that concerns me, not what people think. You will always find those who think they know what is your duty better than you know it. It is easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. It is easy in solitude to live after our own. But the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. This is something that Berkman talked about in 4,000 Weeks, referencing Kierkegaard talking about like the, the automatic man, right? Or the man of culture who just kind of like goes along with the crowd uh, and does what everybody else does. The modern term, right, would be like NPC. Schopenhauer talked about this, again, a very common recurring theme. And John Gray, back in the Straw Dogs episode and in his other book, Feline Philosophy, talks about that might actually be the happy life for a lot of people. It might be easiest for you to choose to be a, an automatic cultural man because kind of like what Emerson is saying here, it is easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. That is the simpler thing to do. It is hard work to go against it and to respect your own ideas and to, and to be independent like this. But I think Emerson is arguing here that you won't ever be fully intellectually happy if you do that. Some part of you will always be unsatisfied. You will see your ideas coming through in other people's work, people who did respect their own ideas, and you will end up having to adopt your own opinion from somebody else. So if you want to be a happy thinking person in the world, you have to be able to be this kind of like non-conformist. You have to be able to ignore what everybody else wants you to do. And he goes on to say how easy it is to lose yourself when you associate with a certain set of ideas. If you maintain a dead church, contribute to a dead Bible society, vote with a great party, either for the government or against it, spread your table like base housekeepers under all these screens. I have difficulty to detect the precise man you are, but do your work and I shall know you. Do your work and you shall reinforce yourself. So even though it's tempting to base our identity on all of these external groups and organizations, these beliefs that we conform to, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm a Muslim, I'm part of the Rotary Club, right? I'm a creator, right? I'm whatever, right? Like I'm Gen Z. Those things don't really tell somebody anything about you because anybody can be a part of those groups. But if you do your work, if you do the thing that is uniquely you, then somebody can know you. There's like a corollary there too, that if you're not doing your work, then you are not a real person in some sense. You were just a member of one of these groups. And so I I think it's actually the, yeah, that is the title of Pressfield's third book, the one that comes after War of Art and Turning Pro from the series that I did a few weeks ago, right? The, the title is Do Your Work. And, and Emerson's really highlighting the like psychological, metaphysical, epistemological importance of doing that. Because if you don't do your work, actually, I think Pressfield's title is Do The Work, but Do Your Work would be a good title too, right? If you don't do your work, then you are not this independent person, right? And, and that doesn't mean that it has to be productive work. For some people, your work could be raising your family. It could be you know, creating a, a beautiful garden around your home. There's a lot of things that could be your work, but unless you find it and do it, you're not really your own person. You're just undescript member of one of these other organizations. But that is hard work, right? And so that's why he says most men have bound their eyes with one another handkerchief and attached themselves to some one of these communities of opinion. Right? There's like this heuristic that uh, I, I enjoy for this kind of idea that if you have a bumper sticker that represents one of your ideas, then you're probably not a very individualized person. Right? If, if you're so comfortable with some group's ideas that you can like put a bumper sticker on your car to broadcast to the world, then you probably haven't thought about things very much. Right? So that's the kind of thinking that Emerson wants you to get away from. That would be uh, a good bumper sticker, actually. So why is this so scary for us? Well, Emerson says that one of the reasons, aside from just the general discomfort of going against the herd, is an overattachment to being consistent. He says the other terror that scares us from self-trust is our consistency, a reverence for our past act or word, because the eyes of others have no other data for computing our orbit than our past acts, and we are loath to disappoint them. This is an interesting way of looking at it, right? We know that other people have a certain opinion and idea of who we are and we don't want to disappoint them so to speak we don't want to go against those opinions and so we feel overly compelled to maintain the same kinds of behaviors same kinds of appearances that we know people are imagining of us 
even if those ideas and appearances are no longer serving us. But that is naturally going to lead to being this kind of like fake person, this just member of a community instead of your authentic self. You are not going to do your work if you are always just holding up this image that other people have of you from your past. And I love what he says here. Why drag about this corpse of your memory? Suppose you should contradict yourself. What then? It seems to be a rule of wisdom never to rely on your memory alone, scarcely even in acts of pure memory, but to bring the past for judgment into the thousand-eyed present and live ever in a new day. And that's a beautiful image, right? That you're, you're dragging this corpse of your past along with you. This past self doesn't even exist anymore. It's not alive anymore. It's just this dead weight holding you back from expressing, you know, what you, what you truly believe and how you truly feel and what you want to do today. And so you have to like throw away that corpse and just let yourself live anew each day. And that might lead to being inconsistent. And this is what brings us to probably the most famous line of this essay. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. And then he goes on, and I think this next part is honestly even better. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with his shadow on the wall. Speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradict everything you said today. Another uh, modern version of this you might heard is, or might have heard, is strong opinions loosely held, right? You should have very strong and well-formed opinions, and you should be willing to change them as soon as you get new information or have a new sense that contradicts what you felt before. There is nothing wrong with that, right? A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. And I love that second part, that with consistency, a great soul has nothing to do. If you're, if you're being consistent, then you don't need to really keep thinking anymore. You just keep repeating the same facts over and over again. You're not going to analyze them because you want to stay consistent with your past self and you don't really have to think about anything anymore. Your great soul has nothing to do because you're just staying consistent. So why would you want to just live that boring life? You should be willing to change your opinions constantly uh, in the light of new information. And this actually leads into uh, another idea in the essay, another idea that has come up a lot in this podcast, in these episodes, about this idea of living in interim, how so much of our life is consumed by thinking about the past or imagining the future, that it pulls us out of the present and prevents us from being able to enjoy our day-to-day -day experiences. He says, man postpones or remembers. He does not live in the present, but with reverted eye laments the past or heedless of the riches that surround him stands on tiptoe to foresee the future. He cannot be happy and strong until he too lives with nature in the present above time. And, and this was talked about really heavily in the 4,000 Weeks episode that I did. It came up in Schopenhauer as well, uh, certainly in Straw Dogs. That we're just obsessed with the past and the future. We, we're always either thinking about something that happened and either like regretting it or analyzing it, or in this example, trying to stay consistent with it, or we're really focused on the future and trying to be prepared for it or uh, worrying about it. He has this great line, man stands on tiptoe to foresee the future, right? We're, we're always like gazing, trying to see what's up ahead instead of man does not live in the present. He's heedless of the riches that surround him. There is so much richness and joy in your life around you if you can only stop looking to the past or the future and become aware of it. But this is it's such an interesting perennial problem, right? It's clearly one of the hardest things for humans to do because it comes up in probably more than half of the books that I've covered on this podcast. It could just because I'm interested in that topic, but a lot of them start with kind of different topics and end up hitting on that subject anyway, right? We are always struggling to enjoy the present moment. And that's where I think the fascination with meditation comes in, uh, fascination with just so many forms of like contemplation slowing down getting out of this mentality. And I think what Emerson is saying here is that, again, you can't really be a authentic human. You can't be living in the truth of your ideas and your work if you are always uh, living in time, right? I love this line. Man cannot be happy and strong until he too lives with nature in the present above time. The trick is to be above it, to see it, but not to be immersed in it and obsessed with it. It's recognized that all we really can ever know is what's happening in the present moment, and that's what we should be trying to fixate on as much as possible. And that's what Berkman was trying to convey in 4,000 weeks as well, right? That our, our time is kind of painfully short uh, on this earth, and so if we're always looking to the past or future and not aware of the richness in the present, then we're never going to be able to fully enjoy it and no amount of wealth or future accomplishment is ever going to make us happy if we can't do it here and now. 
Emerson says that regret too falls into this camp. Yeah. Regret calamities if you can thereby help the sufferer. If not, attend to your work and already the evil begins to be repaired. And this is kind of like a classic stoic idea, right? If you can't do anything about it, then there is no point in regretting it. If there's a way you can help the situation or remedy it or fix it, then go do that so that you can stop thinking about it. But sitting around reminiscing and uh, fretting over something that happened accomplishes nothing except to make you miserable. Same thing about worrying about things in the future, right? The, the more you're consumed with imagining possible futures that may or may not ever happen, and in most cases never will, the more of your present life that you are wasting away and the harder it is for you to enjoy uh, living in the present moments that are available to you. Super quick interruption to just remind you that if you are loving this podcast, if you're enjoying it, if you're getting any value from it, please send it to a friend. That is the most helpful thing that you can do to help this show grow. If you have already sent it to a friend, then I would love it if you took a moment to leave me a review on Spotify, iTunes, anywhere that you get your podcasts. Or if you're not watching the video version on YouTube, uh, just search Nat's Notes, Nat Eliason on YouTube, like, subscribe. Uh, those really, really help the show uh, out as well. So again, thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing and reviewing. And let's get back to the episode. I think this is why he goes on to say that traveling can never really bring you any peace to. He says, traveling is a fool's paradise. Our first journeys discover to us the indifference of places. At home, I dream that at Naples, at Rome, I could be intoxicated with beauty and lose my sadness. I pack my trunk, embrace my friends, embark on the sea, and at last wake up in Naples, and there beside me is the stern fact, the sad self, unrelenting identical that I fled from. I seek the Vatican and the palaces. I affect to be intoxicated with sights and suggestions, but I am not intoxicated. My giant goes with me wherever I go. Again, very common theme, right? We talked about this a lot in the Montaigne uh, essays episode, where there's just something about uh, human nature where we think that if we go to some new location that will uh, like finally make us happy or it will solve some of our problems or it will resolve these fears and anxieties whatnot in our brain and it's just so often not true that we might enjoy it for a time but we end up kind of slipping back into our old ways if we can't figure out how to be happy here and now in the situation we are in we will not be able to figure out uh, how to do it anywhere and this is kind of like the wealth paradox too right if you obsess over getting to some number and then okay then i'll be able to retire and be happy and whatnot it, it just never seems to happen right people adjust or they get to it and then they realize they're not happy because they don't have anything to to do with that time with all those resources so again this kind of think it, it goes back to his idea that unless you are very honest about who you are and what your work is and what you believe and what you need to do you will never be able to be a fully actualized happy person so discovering that discovering your your life's work so to speak and committing to it and the ideas that are authentically yours is the most important thing that you can do for for yourself and there's this other theme attached to it that a lot of the things that we think are improvements or advances are really just kind of a, a cycle in nature right again a theme john gray talked about a lot in straw dog emerson says Society never advances. It recedes as fast on one side as it gains on the other. It undergoes continual changes. It is barbarous. It is civilized. It is Christianized. It is rich. It is scientific. But this change is not amelioration. For everything that is given, something is taken. Society acquires new arts and loses old instincts. What a contrast between the well-clad, reading, writing, thinking American with a watch, a pencil, and a bill of exchange in his pocket and the naked New Zealander whose property is a club, a spear, a mat, and an undivided twentieth of a shed to sleep under. But compare the health of the two men, and you shall see that the white man has lost his aboriginal strength. If the traveler tell us truly, strike the savage with a broad axe, and in a day or two the flesh shall unite and heal as if you struck the blow into soft pitch, and the same blow shall send the white man to his grave. It's a great way of capturing how whenever we gain in one area, we tend to lose in another. And it kind of ties in again, why the like traveling doesn't make you happy, why you have to kind of like be honest with your situation and why like focusing on gaining in one area is always going to lead to some loss in the other, right? We might think of ourselves as these like hyper advanced people because of everything that we have in our society, but we've lost so many of the things that make us human, right? We have changed. We haven't necessarily improved. And all of this collecting and hoarding and changing through technology and whatnot is not necessarily making us any better, certainly not making us any happier. Uh, his notebooks impair his memory, his libraries overload his wit, the insurance office increases the number of accidents, 
And it may be a question whether machinery does not encumber, whether we have not lost by refinement some energy, by a Christianity entrenched in establishments and forms some vigor of wild virtue. So again, all these ways that we think we're improving ourselves, they all come at a cost, right? And people aren't necessarily any seemingly more intelligent or educated or well-read today, despite there being access to orders of magnitude more information than people in previous eras uh, could have gotten access to. And, and they're certainly not healthier in general, all right? Like, we know that is very true today. It's really kind of like all of this it is getting back to Emerson's core point, that you ultimately have to rely on yourself and your own ideas, your own work, your own actions. That has to be really like the main source of truth and strength in your life because anything external is going to lead to inauthenticity and kind of weakness, right? You remember in Denial of Death, Becker talked about how it's really childish when your sense of strength is externalized, right? A child relies on their parent or maybe somebody in their, or like a teacher or their school for their sense of security and strength. They don't have it fully developed. And when we think of somebody as like failing to launch, failing to become a full adult, Part of it is because they still have that childlike reliance on somebody else for their strength and security. This isn't to say that you shouldn't have people you rely on, but ultimately you can't really be a fully fledged adult until that that locus of trust and confidence is internal to you. And Emerson is really, really driving that home with all these ideas that you need to kind of have that faith in yourself. You need to figure out what your work is and do it if you want to be a fully actualized human. So he says, nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles. So you don't want to end up having to adopt your own opinions from somebody else who have the confidence to share them and talk about them. Respect what you believe. Don't be overly committed to your ideas of the past. I, and try to live in the moment and not attach yourselves to the past, the future, to things and ideas around you. Because, again, you can only be fully actualized, fully true to yourself by relying on yourself. If you enjoyed this episode, thank you so much for listening or watching. Uh, you can leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you get podcasts, or like and subscribe on YouTube uh, for the video as well. Uh, finally, as always, if you're enjoying it, please send it to a friend. That is the best way for this show to get out there more. I'm really loving doing it, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next week for another episode of Death Notes. Thanks.